Thank you for coming. Uh, I am Matt Haverland. I am the wildlife coordinator for New Mexico Department of Transportation. And I am Chad Lover. I was the lead biologist on the research we're going to show you part of today. I'm going to be presenting on New Mexico's applied wildlife passage research, and we're going to tie that into a brief update on the Life Quarters Action Plan. New Mexico has about 160,000 miles of roadway. Between 1996 and 2018, there were about 20,000 wildlife legal collisions with 18 fatalities and 2,000 injuries. Research has shown that wildlife legal collisions can be underreported by 50 to 83 percent, so the real number could be as high as 115,000 wildlife legal collisions in that time period. To date, there have been 10 wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects completed in New Mexico since 2004. This is primarily driven by three pieces of legislative action starting in 1998. This effort was initiated by a youth organization called Wild Friends that brought their concerns about wildlife vehicle collisions to the legislation. Here's a brief overlook uh, of the projects completed so far in New Mexico. Uh, and Raton Pass there the, at the bottom is currently under construction. In 2016, NMDOT contracted Arizona Game and Fish Department to do a two-phase evaluation of select NMDOT mitigation projects. Phase one, which this presentation is over, Examine wildlife structure use and wildlife vehicle collision trends for pre and post construction periods at some of these project areas. Uh, the target species examined in this study include mule deer, elk, black bear, and mountain lion. At the end of the study, they will produce a preliminary report detailing their conclusions and preliminary recommendations. And also, they will include four additional case studies. Uh, phase two of the project that has already begun. Uh, we'll continue to collect data at phase one mitigation areas, as well as additional areas, including Chickarica Creek, Cuba, and Raton Pass, which is currently under construction. At the end of phase two, they will combine the phase one and phase two data into a final report. Here are the selected project areas that will be examined in both phase one and phase two. All right, phase one, what I want to do during this section is hit some highlights that we were able to wrap up during phase one. So they let you know what we found and also uh, go into a little more depth on the case studies that concluded during phase one. So let's just jump right into Aztec there. And uh, so Aztec, when you see Aztec, think of big concrete box culverts and how those come into play for our case studies are the center picture you notice that that box culvert has an obstruction or a fence across the face of it in one of the case studies we we're able to look at how does that affect wildlife using it the other thing in aztec as you see in that lower right hand picture is are there some gates in the wildlife fencing that were left open uh, permanently? And how does that affect wildlife vehicle collisions within the mitigation area? Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see these big uh, three concrete box culverts are uh, about a mile apart there. And that number three at the top was the one with the obstruction. All right, next slide. So Tierras Canyon is a very large mitigation, very long mitigation, but I just want to highlight one specific thing on this. So in that center picture, you'll see, or what you do see there is a wildlife crosswalk. So wildlife cross Old Route 66 or New Mexico 333 at grade right on the road. And then about a half mile away from that crosswalk is the structure you see there on the right, a large bridge that allows animals to cross under Interstate 40. And that's only, like I say, only about a half mile away. And animals are able to connect two big chunks of wild habitat on either side of those roadways. 
if they make that connection. And we want to see if they are making that connection between those two structures. Next slide. And you'll just point out, you can see the wildlife crossing structure there, and then East Bridge just right, right a little west of that. So we'll look at that a little closer. So on Raton here, Raton has some unique deer in it. So Raton itself is a small town of about 6,000 people, and it probably has about that many deer. That may be a slight exaggeration, but those deer are there, most of them at least, year round. They're residential deer, and they're very habituated to, to people and to traffic. So we monitored well, two of the structures we monitored in Raton are these ones you see here. So on the center, you'll see a bridge that goes over Interstate 25. And on the right there, you'll see a bridge that goes under Interstate 25. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that First Street and Lincoln Avenue, those are those two structures, are smack dab in the middle of the Raton, of Raton neighborhood. And we are still looking at this uh, to get final results, but up to this point, deer are using those in, in very decent numbers. Um, so that was a surprise during this study. Urbanized deer act a little differently than the ones we've seen in the quote unquote wild. Um, so now let's jump to our last site, Cuba. So in Cuba, we are monitoring two large structures like you see here in the center two bridges that are very similar to this one. And what we looked at during a case study, or if you put a lot of cattle at that structure, how's that gonna impact wildlife use? Um, if we go to the next slide, you can just see that the two bridges we monitored are about a mile apart again. All right, now let's jump to the methods, and I'll just tell you how we went about gathering data. So we gathered crossing structure use data simply, as you can probably imagine, by uh, using trail cameras. So we, I want to tell you we defined use in two different ways because we're looking at two general types of structures. We are looking at large bridges like you see here in the left image. And we know wildlife will use those from past research. And so what we want to know, are they using them? And how many, how many times are they using them? The picture on the right is a concrete box culvert, and we wanted to look at this more specifically because we're monitoring different sizes, and we want to see how that impacts use. So a, a concrete box culvert, what we want to see is how many animals approach that structure, and of those animals, how many do utilize it to cross. So we get a, what we call a passage rate, which is a simple ratio of the number who've crossed divided by the number that approach it to give you just a percentage of use of that structure. Um, then the next wildlife vehicle collision data, we gather two types also. We utilize law enforcement crash data or collision data, which is very consistent throughout the year. So we are able to get good numbers consistently from 2002 to 2018. But we also wanted to look, since we know crashes with smaller animals are often underreported in a database such as law enforcement, we wanted to get more site-specific data. And so we worked with New Mexico DOT patrol yards or maintenance folks in the site uh, we were working with to uh, collect carcass data so those are the two types of wildlife vehicle collision data we're utilizing in this research. Results of the crossing structures uh, included 1.25 million images that were analyzed using rabid software. This included about 18,000 photos of animals of 21 species. There were over 14,000 use events, 12,800 of which were of target species. This is a brief glimpse at the number of use events for each species at different structures. The asset project area, post construction only, and they gathered data at three CBCs. There were about 6,500 uh, use events, 95% of which would, were deer. 
use events were unevenly distributed amongst the CVCs with an average passage, passage rate of 86%. As you see here, underpasses one and two were larger and had more uses. The Raton project area primarily pertains to a post-construction time period. Pre-construction results for Raton Pass were also collected. The research project gathered data at two CDCs, where there were about 3,700 occurrences, 87% of which were deer. Now, use was unevenly distributed amongst CDCs and deer passage rates range from 0 to 81 percent. The Tijeras project area was post-construction only. There were about 2,200 occurrences of five monitor structures, including one at-grade crosswalk and four bridges. 79 percent of the use events were mule and white-tailed deer. Uh, use was unevenly distributed amongst the bridges, and there was no use of the public road, public school road crossing. This is a brief breakdown of wildlife use. The Cuba project area uh, results pertain to pre-construction only. Uh, data was gathered at two bridges and there were 571 occurrences. 42% were mule deer, mostly at the south bridge, and 37% were elk, mostly at the north bridge. Also a brief breakdown of wildlife use in the project area. Uh, statewide, between 2002 and 2018, there were about 15,419 wildlife field collision events. 75% of those included deer. Uh, overall, from in 2018, there was a 51% increase in wildlife field collisions over the 16-year average. Now, the results are pretty interesting in that at Aztec, uh, between 2002 and 2004, there were only 15 wildlife vehicle collisions recorded. Uh, this has um, some certain complications associated with it, uh, and it's likely due to the fact that construction was ongoing during this time, which possibly deterred wildlife and reduced motor speeds. Also, there was a road uh, name change from New Mexico 44 to US 550, which made it a little difficult to to uh, locate wildlife vehicle collision data. Uh, since completion, there have been 123 wildlife vehicle collisions that have been documented, 96% of which were deer, and 33% of those were at the northern terminus of the project area. Uh, this is expected to be likely due to open gates and the fence end. Uh, in the future, uh, the gates will be replaced with the game guard. As you can see in this figure, the project area uh, has shown a lot fewer wildlife field collisions. At the Raton project area, there were about 154 wildlife field collisions before the project was completed, 84% of which were deer. After completion, there were only 12 uh, collisions reported, about the same number of deer, and about half of those at the southern terminus. Now, we need additional years of data to evaluate, evaluate the overall effectiveness but as you can tell by this figure, uh, it seems to be a great reduction uh, post construction and wildlife field collisions. Let's briefly go through the case study results and Chad will elaborate a little bit more on those. Uh, at the game fence gates, we looked at always open gates and mostly closed gates uh, with over 338,000 uh, images collected over 14 months. Now, most of these were deer, and most of them appeared to be using the always open gates. Uh, in fact, there was 84% passage rate at those open gates. At the game guard, there were 374 approaches and uh, only a 4% passage rate. Case study two took place at Tierras Canyon and examined the connectivity between the crosswalk uh, on New Mexico 333 and the East Bridge under I-40. The team was able to positively ID two male deer using the crosswalk and then the bridge. This connectivity is important because it verifies a connection between the Sandia Mountains to the north and the Monzana Mountains to the, to the south, which were historically split by, by the highway. K-2 
Case study three observed wildlife crossing obstructions at Aztec and Raton. Uh, both locations had CDC obstructions at the beginning of phase one. Uh, the short-term obstruction showed a 100% reduction in deer crossings over a period of 110 days. The long-term obstruction was monitored for two years. Uh, after it was removed, it required 16 months to accumulate 100 deer crossings. And then a 19-month period after it, it was removed to accumulate 100 deer crossings per month. Now, other CBCs in the area accumulated 100 deer crossings during the first month. As you can see here during the short-term obstruction, when the fencing was uh, in place uh, in 2017, there were no, no crossing events. Here's just a quick look at the uh, long-term obstruction impact. Our fourth case study looks at wildlife use of crossing structures when cattle are present. Uh, this took place at two different uh, Cuba crossing locations that had cattle, uh, and they were monitored over 144 days. As you can tell by the two figures here at the bottom, when cattle use or cattle presence was higher at the crossing locations, uh, elk and deer use were much lower. And you see here too, as cattle use decrease, uh, the number of elk and deer present at the crossing structures was much higher. Conclusions and recommendations. So in general, what New Mexico DOT has done uh, have, is utilize a cost-effective approach of reducing wildlife vehicle collisions. So if we jump right into, I think game fencing is the first one. Game fencing works, just, just short and to the point. It allows animals to be directed to crossing structures and keeps those animals off the roadways. Um, go on to the next one. Uh, CBC use, our CBCs work for deer. Um, that's a take home message from that one. Uh, game fencing gates are not a good idea if they're gonna be left open within a project. And in my experience, even gates during the project that people believe will be kept closed during that project often are not. And what we found during this research is that open gates allow deer to get in the right of way and be, be hit within that mitigation project. It's much better to use game guards. Um, wildlife crossing obstructions decrease the use. Long-term instructions, obstructions that are in for a long period of time will impact that structure's use for a long period of time, even after that obstruction is removed. Um, if it's a short-term obstruction, it will usually obstruct the use for just that short period of time. And once it's removed, the structure will be used again. And cattle, in large numbers at crossing structures does impact wildlife using those structures. We found as the number of cattle went up, the number of wildlife utilizing that structure went down. Okay, so phase two, we will continue the research we've begun, at least most of it in phase one. We'll add a couple sites, but I want, what I wanna highlight about phase two are two things. We're gonna be looking at an animal detection system in Cuba that alerts motorists. We wanna see how those motors respond and how their response reduces wildlife vehicle collisions in that area. And the second thing I wanna highlight is Raton Pass, because at Raton Pass, which is this picture you see here, are they are excavating an area to put an arch, a large arch culvert for animals to be able to pass under the roadway. And that large arch culvert is replacing a little, little, little concrete box culvert that was never used by any wildlife except bears to cross under that roadway. Now, the results of this research is uh, very significant because in 2019, New Mexico signed the Wildlife Corridors Act, which directs uh, the, the Department of Game and Fish and the DOT to address wildlife field collision hotspots and fragmented migratory routes across the state. Currently, the draft is still under development, but it may be out to the public by the time this presentation is given.
Now, this research is very important to the future of mitigation projects in New Mexico that will likely result from the action plan is to help identify a structured design and placement to maximize effectiveness. Uh, we've also been able to been able to troubleshoot issues encountered in previous projects, and it will help provide guidelines to collecting baseline data analyzing project effectiveness post construction. Now, this has been a, uh, a large team effort, so I, I'll, I do want to give a big thanks to uh, Chad and Jeff Gagnon and, and their team from Arizona Game and Fish, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Research Bureau with the New Mexico Department of Transportation and uh, Jim, Jim Hirsch, who has also been very helpful in get, uh, seeing this research through with the Environmental Bureau. Uh, additionally, I want to give a big thanks to Mark Watson over at New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Thank you for attending our presentation.